Um, before we start, and it's totally cool if everybody's not ready yet, but I'm going to read a quick content warning. This case discusses genocide in Yugoslavia and Rwanda. It doesn't include any graphic descriptions whatsoever. It just uses the word genocide as nothing that isn't in a history textbook or a newspaper article. But if it's going to make the run an unsafe place, I'm going to send an anonymous opt-out form. And we're going to switch out the term with a less sensitive one, if that's better. Um, even, wait one second. Even if you'd like to opt in, just fill out the form so I can know when we're good to go. If you've opted in already, I don't know. I, I think it's fine, but. I have four responses. Did the judge that already opted in not fill it out? I did, yeah. You did fill it out? Okay. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Oh, okay. I have all five, so we're good to go. Okay, awesome. I think the live stream is working and that everybody's here. So am I good to start? Is everybody ready? Oh, one second. Everybody ready? You just give me like one, just one second. I just gotta grab something real quick. All right, I'm all good. So, everybody ready? Uh, yeah, everybody's ready. Uh, can we just start with a quick round of introductions? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm Sana. I'm going to be debating first for Riverdale Country School, who's going to be debating on the next side of this debate and going to be debating first. Hi, Sana. Hi, uh, my name is Jessica. I am speaking second for Riverdale Country School, and we are again con on the first, on speaking first. Hi, Jessica. I'm Mehul. I'm speaking first for Hawken, and we're second pro. Hi, Hawken. Mehul. Right, and I'm, I'm Julian. I'm speaking second for Hawken, and we are the second speaking team on the app. Hi, Julian. Okay, so we can start when everybody is ready. Okay, awesome. Um, is everybody ready now? Riverdale negates our sole connection is genocide. Subpoint A is Bosnia and Herzegovina. The IMF facilitated the breakdown of the Yugoslav economy in two key ways. First is economic mismanagement. As Beams in 1999 writes that while earnings have been eroded by inflation, the IMF ordered the freeze of wages, causing them to collapse by 41%. This was coupled with devaluation of the dinar leading to another round of price increases. Inflation soared at a 1,134%, pricing everyone out of goods and tearing the country apart with the richer provinces, objecting to being drained of resources by the poorer provinces. The second is resource allocation. Michelle Rice the 
the IMF controlled the Yugoslav Central Bank. Its tight money policy further crippled federal Yugoslavia's ability to finance its economic and social programs. State revenue went instead to service Serbia's debt instead of being evenly distributed amongst republics. By cutting the financial arteries between Belgrade and the republics, the reforms fueled secessionist tendencies that fed on economic factors as well as ethnic divisions and virtually ensured the de facto secession of the republics. The IMF paved the way for Croatia's and Slovenia's formal secession in June 1991. For these two reasons, Beams continues that Yugoslavia broke into pieces of ethnic and religious rivalries were reasserted in an attempt to control declining economic conditions. Reforms caused massive and repeated strikes and labor actions, eroding the social fabric that individuals had come to rely on. He concludes that Yugoslavia was a functioning state until the IMF took over economic policy and that the genocide arrived only after shock therapy had done its work as people resorted to tribalism after the IMF's disgraceful loaning practices sent the nation into utter chaos. Devastatingly, the civil war that followed the IMS meddling resulted in a devastating gen genocide. As History.com writes, the Bosnian Serb forces, with the backing of the Serb-dominated Yugoslav army, perpetrated atrocious crimes against Bosnia, Bosnian Muslim, and Croatian civilians, resulting in the deaths of 100,000 people by 1995. Step point B is Rwanda. The IMF laid the groundwork for the Rwandan genocide in three key ways. First is working consolidation. Maloney 2017 writes that in the 1980s, the IMF encouraged coffee exporting states to expand their production. As a result, the coffee market was extremely saturated and the price collapsed. In Rwanda, the oversupply of coffee meant that the price collapsed, caused the government's budget to be cut 70%, leading to a reduction of spending on social services. The oversaturation of coffee also meant that Rwandan exports climbed to 50%. As a result, thousands of Rwandan farmers lost their livelihoods. This directly produced the genocide as Maloney continues that SAP conditions on Rwanda's coffee industry created incentives to join the army and the Interamme militia, later the perpetrators of the Rwandan genocide. Further, the economic destabilization incited by the SAPs fueled social tensions, which precipitated the outbreak of the genocide. Thus, he concludes in 1980s, SAPs created the economic and the social conditions that accompanied the beginning of the genocide in Rwanda. Second is through armament. To say 19 FC ADTM writes that the loans from the IMF made it possible for the government to pay for the massive purchase of weapons attended with genocide. Military expenses increased threefold between 1990 and 1992. That's because the IMF allowed Rwanda to submit old invoices for imported goods in order to pay back loans, allowing them to make weapons purchases. They also did not expose the existence of bank accounts the Rwandan government had in foreign banks on which there were substantial amounts of money still available to buy more weapons. IMF couldn't have cared less. In fact, the American-controlled IMF was happy Rwanda was buying American guns. Tusein continues that they should have stopped their loans in 1992 when they learned the money was being used to buy weapons. They should have warned the UN at once, but they went on supplying support until 1993, helping a government commit genocide. The third way is through privatization. IMF privatization measures exacerbated ethnic tensions. As Hochschild in 2012 explains that SAPs have been an increased support of the private sector and cuts to the public sector in order to spur economic growth. Therefore, the perception was that the Tutsis were favored by the SAPs and that many and many Hutu elites in the public sector fear to lose their employment and subsequently their influence. The impacts were absolutely devastating as the genocide took 800,000 lives in just 100 days and the war that followed took hundreds of thousands of more. The damage done by the genocide transcends borders. As COPPA 2019 writes, the perpetrators of the genocide, along with their IMF-funded weapons, retreated to what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo, contributing to attacks by armed groups in eastern Congo. COP concludes that these attacks have caused millions and millions of people to continue to be killed in the last 25 years. Thus, we negate. All right. Um, can I just see your evidence that's linking into your like secondary impact about um, Congo? And then... I just realized we totally forgot to set up an email chain. That's true. Yeah. All right. We'll we'll drop our emails in the chat. I can start it. While you set that up, I'm gonna go get a charger for my computer. Okay. Um, sorry, can you just text the evidence that you want in the chat and then we'll get it. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. I just sent out the chain. Let me know when you'll get it. And then Jessica will respond with the evidence. Is 
Sorry, it's formatted really, really weirdly. I don't know what happens to the cut card, but I'll just like take time to underline it in the email because the thing went away. You want coffee and privatization too? Yep. That's cool. Sonic, can you get those? Awesome. Every the cop card is in. Okay, all mine is sent to. All right, I'll tell you when I get that. I got it. Now you can read case. All right. So let me just open the case. Okay. Uh, also, I have to get that timer. All right. Um, is everyone good? Yeah. Cool. We affirm contention one is curbing China. The China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPEC, is a program of Chinese-funded infrastructure projects. India perceives it as a serious threat. Chaudhry 20 of the Economic Times confirms that a powerful counterbalance to the rising India CPEC is a tool to encircle India. However, the IMF has countered the influence of China by shutting down CPEC. In order to renegotiate Pakistan's IMF program, the Times of India 21 reports that the IMF will resume the program only if Pakistan does not take out any new commercial loans. Consequently, SACS 21 of the Council on Foreign Relations confirms that post-IMF bailout, Pakistan is now looking to delay debt repayment to China for a decade. CPEC is unlikely to ever fulfill the grand vision laid out in 2015. The impact is preventing war. CPEC is highly threatening to India as it represents China's partnership with India's most dangerous enemy. If CPEC is completed, Marquis 17 of War on the Rocks writes that India will explore conventional military initiatives in response to what it interprets as an, as an and expect expanding strategic threat. Pakistan is poised to respond to any Indian conventional maneuvers with its large nuclear arsenal. Wilson 19 of the National Interest writes, Pakistan's growing inventory of tactical nuclear weapons are part of an effort to counter an Indian conventional incursion onto Pakistani territory. Consequently, war between India and Pakistan could lead to the deaths of 2 billion people. Contention two is recession recovery. The IMF allocates special drawing rights or SDRs, which are unconditional injections of capital to countries in crisis. In fact, Talks 21 of CNBC reports the Treasury is working with the IMF to provide $650 billion in currency aid to countries hit hardest by the pandemic. This has worked before. During the 08 crisis, 920 of Yale University writes the SDR allocation increased reserves by 19% for low income countries and helped to close fiscal gaps, meet external obligations, or counteract foreign exchange shortages. Similar, similarly to 08, SDRs can provide the economic stimulus that the world needs. Lipsky 21 of the Wall Street Journal explains that SDRs provide liquidity to many emerging and developing countries that have severely limited access to external financing, but have the pressing need to pay for health and economic support. Consequently, Sonnet 20 of the University of Notre Dame writes, issuing SDRs is currently one of the most useful options to help contain the pandemic and keep the global economy from collapsing. The impact is preventing a crisis. The World Bank 20 projects that absent economic recovery, the current recession could push as many as an additional 115 million people into extreme poverty, poverty this year, with the total rising to as many as 150 million by 2021. Contention three is the global financial safety net. According to Stiglitz 20 of Columbia University, a global debt crisis is looming. More than 100 low and middle income countries will still have to pay a combined $130 billion in debt service this year with much economic activity suspended and fiscal revenues in free, school, free fall. Many countries will be forced to default. If indebted countries defaulted, they would bring down Western financial institutions with them. This is because as Vogel 20 of the American interest confirms, there's a formidable amount of debt owed by governments to private international investors. 
this would end in disaster. According to McDowell 17 of Syracuse University, as banks feel the possibility of foreign losses on multiple fronts, concerns about the capital adequacy of banks generate fears that banks might fail, threatening the stability of the entire domestic financial system. However, the IMF prevents a collapse of the global financial system. The IMF's loans ensure that in the event of a country does default, the brunt of the losses are taken by the IMF and not by Western financial institutions. For example, Krugman 12 of Princeton University writes that in the 1980s, debt crisis in low-income countries threatened to bring down the international financial system. So the IMF stepped in to provide loans to countries that could not pay back their foreign creditors. Consequently, the IMF ensures that these crises do not spill over to the rest of the financial system. Absent the IMF, a financial crisis of this magnitude would be catastrophic. In the last great financial crisis, Boston University concludes that 100 million people fell into poverty, thus we affirm. Jessica, do you need any evidence? Can I just see your uh, preventing, the IMF is preventing war through CPAC, like just like your link evidence? Um, I'm just going to run to the bathroom really quickly, if that's okay. I'll be back in like one minute. I just sent those cards. I got it. Okay, in that case, I'm good to start calls, I think. All right, let me just get a timer. Okay, yeah, you can have first question. Okay, I'm gonna start time now. So where do SDRs come from? It's the IMF's currency, and it's like invested in by each country. It's like each country has their own amount of like SDRs. I know, I know, but like, where does that currency come from? Like, it doesn't just exist, right? What do you mean? Where does it come from? Yes, yeah, like where does the money that creates that currency that can be delivered to countries? All countries. So countries put money into the reserve, and then they get that money back. Okay. And then the money that's given is allocated based on how much they put in in the first place. Okay. So if Africa has really small economies and contributes less to the IMF during COVID- That doesn't really matter because you can trade for SDRs, but SDRs can also be treated as a loan that the IMF gives to a country. But can I have a question? Wait, what? what? SDRs aren't loans. No, they can That's be not- treated as a loan. Yes, they can. can. Tra- wait, 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 that makes no sense. You said that it's no okay. conditionality delivering of currency. That's what, mm-hmm. and it comes from their reserves. Sure. So- so how can it be treated? Not necessarily. It can also be just the IMF giving money. As in a, no, no, but the IMF doesn't just give money, right? That's, not- that's a loan. Yes, you have to pay it back. But then, that, but then that's not an SDR anymore. That is an SDR. They give a loan of SDRs to a country. But can I have a question? That doesn't make any sense. How can they loan SDRs? That's they definitely- just loan the money. It's in the form of an SDR. All right, it's been a minute and a half. Can I have a question? Yeah, for sure. Sure. So on like Yugoslavia, when was the fall of communism? Uh, I'm not sure. Why don't you tell me? It was 1991. When was the Yugoslavian wars? Also in the 1990s. 1991 to 2004. The cause of the Yugoslavian wars was not anything to do with the IMF. It was literally the fall of communism. So how does the IMF play into this? Well, firstly, you can make that argument in rebuttal, but more importantly, I'd say that even if the fall of communism happened, even if all of the economic conditions were the same, without the IMF, A, the freeze of wages wouldn't have happened, which is what created the incentive for people to go to genocide. But then secondly, and more importantly, wait, 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 wait. How, does, how does increasing... Can sure, I you can finish. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Secondly, and most importantly, resource allocation was divided unequally, which meant that poor people, it seemed like the poor people was stripping the resources from the richer people, which gave them the incentive to start the genocide. Sure. Even if the fall of communism happened, there was sure. no incentive for them to specifically kill 100,000 people. But Sure, but like, why was like, why did increasing wages, I think, or decreasing, whatever it was, increasing wages create the incentive just, just to start murdering people? It, it, it priced everybody out of goods. Okay, so why did they just start killing each other? 
because that created the incentive for the genocide because it seems okay. like one group was harming the other group because that's what the IMF policies did. Okay, so when one group harms another, they just start murdering each other. Can you give me any other example of that? Rwanda. No, not in, okay, sure. <laughs> I cross this basically over. Awesome. I'm gonna read weighing at the top and then go down their case. I'll signpost. At the top, genocide comes first as Katz argues that genocide disables the moral inhibition person specific mass murder raises these stakes from individual denouncement to group dehumanization. Second, Ochab in 2020 writes that the official recognition of historic cases as genocide um, is not a matter of semantics, only a sharp focus on like current pu public apathy on the early warning signs of genocide can be um, can prevent the crime from occurring in the future. The IMF was an early warning sign condemn it now. Thirdly, the neg solves as that lesson continues every contemporary citizen cognizant of a specific ongoing instance of genocide Aside, regardless of where in the world is a bystander and even the most remote bystander is the only source of hope left. Neglecting to do something about genocide carries a message that the action may proceed. So that means that anything besides a firm rejection of institutions that perpetrate genocide in this round allows its uniquely dehumanizing traits to compound in other regions of the world. Go to their case at CPAC at the top. First, the IMF got them there as Abdul in 2019 explains that previous IMF loans forced Pakistan to take on massive debt from other actors like China, increasing interest rates to 70% and crushing their economy. Moreover, to Saint in 2019 finds that the IMF forces governments they dislike to pass unpopular policies, increasing the chance of coups by 207%. That's why Abdul finds that it empirically led to military dictatorships in Pakistan, which means that all of their links are merely, merely failing to solve a problem they created themselves. And Rolt 07 finds that repressive regimes trigger anti-state vengeance and thus increases the chance of civil war by 16 times. That links into all of their impacts because their link is basically that the region is really, really unstable right now. Now, I would say that the only reason why Pakistan had to turn to China in the first place was because the IMF. Secondly, their argument isn't true. As foreign policy in 2020 writes that Pakistan is now doubling down on CPAC and has a renewed interest in the program, preferred this over their evidence, which is from 2015. But then thirdly, turn it. Chickermain in 2019 explains that given its sponsoring of numerous terror groups, Pakistan could use six billion dollars in IMF loans to finance and strengthen terrorist infrastructure and furthers that Pakistan's expenditures are highly opaque. Azad in 2016 finds that terrorist groups so distrust between India and Pakistan provoking conflicts that could escalate into nuclear war. Then on SDRs. First, SDRs are minimal as Oxfam and FAM in 2020 writes that 84% of COVID loans push for butt tight, belt tightening measures that could result in deep cuts to public health care systems and social protection. I say that yes, SDRs are happening right now, but that's the other of the other 16% of all loans offered and austerity measures make it so that the SDRs don't actually go towards social spending. But then second, more in 2021 explains that SDRs are allocated according to a country's IMF quota, meaning that the entire continent of Africa will only see 10, sorry, 7% of allocations, whereas developed countries receive the rest, which is nowhere near enough to help the countries they don't solve. But then thirdly, countries put in their own money into a reserve that they get back allocated on a quota for, to, for and SDRs, meaning that A, they get less money than they began with, and B, the money gets sent to them way too late, when in reality, if they had the money to begin with, they could have beefed up their healthcare infrastructure and helped stop the COVID pandemic from spreading before it started. On their third contention, at the top, turn it. The IMF keeps countries stuck in a cycle of intergenerational poverty, as Ghazali in 2019 writes that IMF officials convince countries that are strategically important to the United States to accept enormous loans for infrastructure development and make sure that lucrative projects were contracted to, to only U.S. corporations. Instead of pulling countries out of poverty, the money flowed directly to U.S. companies and gave the U.S. a stranglehold over the economic and political resources of indebted nations. The IMF systematically crushes economies, and that's why Breland confirms that the average stint out of an IMF program before returning is just five years. That means that they're not falling for long-term growth. And that's why their stat about 100 million people falling into poverty was with the IMF there. But then you can turn it again. And ask in 1998 explains that absent the IMF, countries would be forced to renegotiate debt because defaults leave both the countries and um, debtors with nothing. He further said the IMF Pre prevents politicians from experiencing the realities of poor economic policies, preventing any widespread reforms to stop future debt issues in the future, meaning that if you want long-term debt, the IMF is even worse for that in the long run. Thus, you're always negating. All right, cool. Um, can I see the 7% of quota, uh, like 7% of FDR, SDR allocations go to the African continent? and um, Pakistan's funding terror groups. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, and then whatever this intergenerational poverty thing is. Sana, can you send the econ overview and then I'll send the rest? Oh, which one did you want me to send? The uh, Vreeland evidence and like the the IMF forces countries to like take loans from the United States. Yeah, It's sad. Sorry about that, minus in as well. All right, did you send everything? Yep. All right, sweet. Then I'm gonna start running prep now. All right, that was like 210. Just wanted to call for another piece of evidence. Uh, whatever says that they're like doubling down on CPEC right now in Pakistan. Sure.
Wait, did you send the intergenerational poverty term? Yep. Uh, whose email would that be on? Because I got two. Mine. All right. Yeah, we're going to run the remainder of our prep uh, starting. All right, that was total, I think total 240. All right, it's gonna be um, on their wang, then frontlining, and then down their case. Cool, is anyone not ready? Great, then my time will start, <clears throat> sorry, then my time will start now, on their weighing, first we're going to read Lincoln to, Lincoln's to this later, but on a few of their mechanisms. First, they say we have the IMF is causing genocide. No, that only contributes to future programs. But what Washington finds in 2020 is that the IMF has literally stopped using F SAP or structural adjustment programs, which they say are bad. There's no warrant leading into the future programs, which means there's no ethical reason to stop. But on to our, their responses on our case. They say first that like the IMF caused the strife. No, that's completely untrue. There's been many, many conflicts between Pakistan and India since like 1960s and way, way before that on ethnic levels. No reason why the IMF is actually unique. Then they say it forces a coup. That's not actually true. They just assert this. But in reality, the IMF is the one who is decreasing these sort of like negative ethnic tensions and doing things like that. Because Brown finds that if you do a comparative between the countries that had IMF loans and those that did not. In Argentina, for example, who did not get an IMF loan, Brown 09 writes that virtually the entire government literally had to resign and the federal police cracked down on protesters. However, in Mexico, who did get an IMF loan, they literally had political stability the whole time. That's because Watson writes that the very austerity that they tell you is really, really bad is really good for these countries because in the status quo since 2016, the autocracies that the IMF gives loans to have to cut money away from military spending in favor of greater proportionate social spending. That's really good because it means that the military spending goes down and the Coups are less likely because the military has more force who, has the, who is the number one per, uh, per, per, perpetrator of coups. Then they say really quickly that like foreign policy is really bad and it's like increasing CPEC. No, their card is from 2020. Our card is from 2021. They say it's from 2015. No, it's not. Look at the Times of India card. But then they say terror groups are really bad, but their card doesn't say it's because of the IMF, one. And two, their card just says that Pakistan might do these sorts of things. And it's talking about CPEC initiatives on terrorist infrastructure. So that doesn't really link in at all. But on our C2, I'll just concede that it happens either way. They just say that it's like would have been better because they get more money back. No, the quotas are specific. If I pay $800 billion in Quotas, then I get that back on net. Sure, I might not get that back all in SDRs, but I get it back in other allocations like RFCs, but on they say intergener intergenerational poverty, but there's no actual warrant for this. They're just saying that because they spend more, it's going to be really, really bad because they think they're doing well. But no, under a non-IMF program, they're literally in debt. They have nothing to spend on, and the poverty is just worsened. Onto their case. At the top on their C1 about Yugoslavia, cross apply what my partner said crossfire. There's no actual reason why this is because of the IMS program specifically. Look to NPR who writes that there were literally massive ethnic divides in Yugoslavia way before the IMF came in, which is what their card that I run literally concedes. It says that it was really, really bad before functioning, but it really wasn't. In the long run, the only thing that broke down the Yugoslavian war was, then their, was when their leader died. And that's why literally the number one time, the time at which the Yugoslavian civil war happened was the same year that the communist rule broke up. That's not correlation. And that's because NPR furthers that when the communist leader died, those republics pulled apart because they had no one that brought them all together. It's not about economic policy. But then they just give a few reasons. They say resource allocation because they think it's going to the rich. No, what they did in that country was they went through and changed things like international investment 
investment quotas and price controls that had nothing to do with giving like taxation to the rich or poor. That was what the government did in response to economic downturn. But on their subpoint fear about Rwanda, they say it was because of the IMF. Once again, it literally wasn't. BBC 11 finds that because of ethnic divide called, caused by like Belgian colonists that came in way before, they literally like named certain people certain things and they gave them cards of identification, which was the reason that, that there was way more ethnic tensions before. In fact, like 20,000 people died in a conflict in 1950, way before the genocide. But then the real reason happened was because of a really short spark. They shot down the plane of the president and he died. The same is true with Yugoslavia. It was one instance. If all it took was a economic recession and then a sparking instance, there's just no reason why the IMF is the only agency that actually did that. But we also link into their framing because CPEC is also genocide. Obviously, Pakistan and India are going against each other as nationalists and ethnical conflict divides. But you can also read the link in on our sub point C because if if you have no safe safety nets and if the world collapses, then you have less stability worldwide, which is why, as they say, in case when economic downturn goes up, the number of people that are forced to go to ethnic conflict goes up as well. All right, I'm good for cross. All right. Okay, so why would the Indo Pak conflict result in genocide? It literally is genocide, right? Like the definition of genocide is just mass killing on the base of ethnicity or nationality. Well, it's usually when one group has a substantial amount of power over another and you were talking about a civil war, right? That's not, it's not a, a genocide. No, we're, not. we're not talking about a civil war, right? India and Pakistan are not the same state, right? If India attacks sorry, sorry, you're Pakistan, talking about a war, that's my bad. But what? genocides usually happen within a country, right? Sure, so usually. Okay, that's fine. We'll contest it later. Do you have a question? All right, let's go to your point about in response to inter or you're saying intergenerational poverty, right? So is your argument that because they get an IMF loan, they do crazy spending, which for like which hurts them in the long run, or what's the argument? No, we read you very clearly that the IMF always has the incentive to prop up US corporations. So they always force like insane spending on stuff that countries really just don't need. So like, in, it's not like moral hazard in the sense in which countries are making the decision. It's that the IMF strategically forces right. countries to spend a lot on like unnecessary stuff. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Okay, you can have a question. Oh, we also have another response, but anyways. Uh, yeah, okay. let's talk about Rwanda. So why they like the belgians came and colonized rwanda in 1916. Yep. why is it that two years or why is it that for the entirety of the like existence of rwanda for that period and from before when ethnic divides still exist why is it that this large-scale genocide only happened two years after the imf got involved i mean like that's like saying why did world war one not happen in the 1800s right like it's exactly the same argument the tension still existed and you saw a lot of small-scale conflicts like 20,000 people dying or things like that but you didn't see a large-scale conflict like your argument is just about like coffee and things like that which all lead into economic downturn so if economic downturn is the spark that causes these sorts of conflicts then if there's any recession why don't they just happen in that world as well well, because the IMF uniquely supplied weapons, which is something that's untouched in Republic. Like the IMF does not give them weapons, though. That's it not your argument. Money. You said it gives them loans. No, it gives them money to buy weapons, and it set up un, like non, non transparent loaning structures and knew that the uh, that Rwanda was buying weapons, and yet didn't so say. So if they it. have if they have money and they can buy weapons, then it's not unique to the IMF. No, because if they can buy weapons, they can buy weapons, but everybody else knows about it. The IMF was covering up for them. And that's like the- that, Wait, wait, wait. If they're not buying weapons from the IMF, but buying from the US government, then why is the IMF the one that's covering them up? Because I get that the IMF is the one that's covering the funding streams, but if they had money and they could buy weapons from the US government, then why is the IMF the one? So they labeled the machetes as agricultural transactions and as, as well as a lot of the other guns and about weapons. Okay. And why couldn't the Rwandan government do that anyways? Like if they weren't buying from the IMF, but from the US purchase, because it's an international purchase. Sure. If the IMF is not the like middleman in that purchase, then why, how do they have the ability to do that? It's time. All right. Hey prep. I'll hold down my timer. All
We're stopping prep there. Um, Jessica was timing. That was 2.15. Okay, it's gonna start on the framing and then it'll go our case, their case. Okay, awesome. Is everybody ready? Sorry. Yeah? Okay, awesome. Time starts now. Let's start on the framing debate. First, let's look at their responses. Firstly, they say that the IMS stopped using SAPs. That's not our warrant. Our warrant is that whenever you ignore genocide in any context, any context, no matter whether you're involved in it, you allow the action to compound because you're letting it seem like the action is okay. That's why you can extend our framing. You're prioritizing genocide first because those that know that genocide is happening or has happened should not take action against it or bystanders who have less than 20 arguments allow genocide to keep happening and compound in different situations all around the world. Not arguing, not acting is still acting and neglecting genocide carries the message that the action may proceed. Also, look at our awesome evidence. Austerity is rising as of 2020. On their Lincolns, firstly, they say that CPEG is genocide, A, no warrant on how a war is going to lead to dehumanization. That's, it's not one ethnic group taking out another ethnic group. It's one government fighting over another government, which is exactly their warrant. On their second Lincoln about how there's less world stability, there's no contextualization. There's less world stability right now when all countries are going through recession because of COVID. You don't see a single genocide happening because of that, but we're giving you two, we we're giving you a really contextualized example to have when the IMF went in, there was a genocide because they funneled um, arms into the military. Let's go to our case about Rwanda. At the top, our second link is 100% conceded. Even if ethnic tensions existed, and even if there was a spark because of the precedent, the only way that the genocide could have been committed is if the IMF gave the money to funnel arms. They're trying to make new responses and cross, but you can't evaluate them. They said that Belgium and Belgium increased ethnic tensions. You can just go back to my top star response. And they said that they shot down the plane, but we'd argue that the plane was just a scapegoat and they would have blamed it on anything else at the point at which they concede that weapons are being stockpiled since far before that. Let me send our second link. They say that and that the IMF by directly funneling money to the Rwandan government allowed the Hutu minority to, co co to commit a genocide against the Tutsis. The IMF knew weapons were being stockpiled, did nothing. They also created the lending structures, which led to a genocide that could close to 100,000 people. The impacts are still happening and killing millions in Congo. Let's go to their case at the top on China. Firstly, you can send the Abdul turn, which tells you that the IMF caused Pakistani's instability because pa Pakistan frequently approached the IMF for loans. And every time the loans were accompanied by SAPs, those programs didn't achieve their uh, objectives. Pakistan interest payments averaged 17% of government revenue and the IMF propped up various military governments in Pakistan. Their only response is that like it, there was way more conflicts. Be, there was way more conflicts. But that's not a response. We're telling you that the only reason that Pakistan needed to turn to China was because the IMF put them into so much debt that they had to go to them, and that's why they leveraged well because of the CPAC. That's why the CPAC was created in the first place. That means that we're a prerequisite to their argument because if IMF hasn't messed up Pakistan's economy, then CPAC wouldn't have been created because China wouldn't have gotten so much power. Let's go to their third contention about a global financial safety net. You can turn it because IMF triggers repression in statement 16, you can extend our turn because IMF obliges governments to reduce expenditures and, oh, sorry, sorry, that, that's the wrong turn. There, uh, the basket turn is 100% conceded and tell you that absent the IMF, countries would be forced to renegotiate debt because defaults leave both creditors and debtors with nothing. He further that the IMF prevents politicians from experiencing the realities of poor economic policies, which prevents any widespread reforms to, form to future debt issues. That means that that outweighs their entire case on time frame because even if right now they're like trying to stop some type of global safety net, all developing countries are going to fall into defaults in the future because their debt builds up to a point of no return. For all those reasons, vote now. All right, can we just see your rabbit? Uh, wait, what was it? Ah, never mind. I'm good. Actually, wait, I remember what it was. Uh, the evidence that says that they were stockpiling before the plane got shut down, basically. Sana, can you send it to Saint? The dates on the evidence are super explicit. It was happening for like four years. Did you send it? All right, I'll say, let me get it.
All right. Okay, I'll just start running prep when I raise my hand because I got to call my partner. Okay, that was, I'm pretty sure, all our prep. So let me get a timer out. All right, I'm gonna go framing our case, their case. Is everyone good? Yeah, cool. Okay, start on the framing. We'll concede that genocide is the most important thing in the round that kicks out all their economic turns on our C3. But more importantly, we link into their framing about genocide extend the link chain of curbing China really clearly. We tell you from Chaudhry 20 that the SPCPEC is used to encircle India and it, it signals that Pakistan is expanding their territory and it's seen as an expansive strategic strategy to India. That's really crucial because the Times of India 21 explains that the uh, India sees this as a threat and they will engage militarily if, this, if they continue to expand CPEC. What's really important is that the Times of India 21 furthers that the IMF has blocked this because they aren't giving Pakistan loans unless they stop getting loans with China. That's why we haven't seen this progress anymore. That's really crucial because the genocide that would come from an India-Pakistan war would be 2 billion people. That scope weighing vastly outweighs any sort of weighing they do even on genocide. They say we give no warrant as to how this is genocide. India versus Pakistan is literally an ethnic conflict of genocide. It is, they've had ethnic conflicts for so many years. They've had four wars in the past due to ethnic conflict. It is clearly genocide. And you're going to prefer our argument because of the sheer scope. Two billion people is larger than any impact they give you in this entire round. They extend one response on this case. They say that structural adjustment programs are the reason the IMF got, the, got Pakistan to get into, to like take loans from China. They drop the evidence, Julian tells you, that they, since 2014, they stopped structural adjustment programs. Those aren't there anymore. That means their response makes no sense. We have the strongest strength of link. You can vote for us there. On their case, they collapse on Rwanda. They, they only front line, they completely drop the BBC evidence that says there was an ethnic divide there before, and that's why 20,000 people died in Rwanda prior to, their, prior to the um, genocide they're talking about. But then on the point about shooting down the plane of their leader, they just said, like, it doesn't matter because the only reason it happened was because the IMF gave them money to, like, buy weapons. Rwanda had weapons before the IMF went in there. They had the ability to do this anyway. It's because they fell into a recession. That's the spark Julian tells you about. There's only a small spark that causes this to happen. But more importantly, go back to the Lincoln and weighing. The scope weighing is always in our favor. Two billion largest impact in the round from nuclear war the uh, nuclear war also caused like caused like a bunch of fallout and stuff like that so that probably leads to extinction a uh, largest impact in the round but more importantly on the genocide their only response to our lincoln about genocide called an indo pak war funding causing genocide is 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 that it's not genocide but genocide is literally an ethnic conflict that kills a bunch of people they said in cross that oh one superpower has to be larger that's only in some cases. Not all genocide is like that. An Indo-Pakistan war that leads to nuclear war killing 2 billion is the largest piece of genocide in the entire round. You're always going to prefer us on scope, strength of link, and clarity. We're linking into their own framework better than, their, better than they are. Can I see that Rwanda had weapons beforehand?
All right, I sent the 20,000. Start cross when I get it. Okay, um, y'all good for cross? Yep. Yeah. Um, where exactly in your evidence does it say that they had weapons, that the government had weapons? The argument is that they had the capability to kill people before. It's like a cross after the 20,000. Okay, that's fine. Okay, okay, perfect. You guys have a question. All right, sure. Uh, sweet. Uh, I don't really have a question. Actually. Okay, I'll take another one. Do you know the difference between war and genocide? Okay, I mean, I've looked up the definition of genocide, and if you're going to tell me that one group has to be stronger, then I think you should read it as That's well. Absolutely it... not what I'm going to say. So I'm just, you're going to answer my question. All right, then what are you going to say? I was going to say that genocide is defined by its incentive. When you go to war, you're not trying to take out another group because of their ethnicity. When you go to genocide, you're specifically mass murdering an entire other group of people because yeah. you Peter them inferior to you. According Which is to what, the that's exactly. literally the entire India conflict Pakistan. between India and Pakistan. No, that, wait, wait. Your argument is that CPEC is going to cause India to become scared of Pakistan no. and launch a weapon. Our argument is that wait, is CPEC, argument? our argument is that India views CPEC as expansionary for Pakistan and because exactly. of ethnic divides, they don't want Pakistan to take them over, right? Exactly. So it's about expansionism, not because yeah. they're- Yeah, Muslim. expansionism of the ethnic state. Yeah. They don't like that they're expanding into their territory. No, not it's that they're not expanding into their territory. The argument is that they're becoming stronger. It's not about like military right. conflict. That, that poses that poses a threat to India, right? That's not a military they, threat. Okay, okay. If if that didn't happen, would they still go to would would they still kill each other? What is that? No, what, what do you right? mean? So there's not an what? wait, what? Yes, they you're, yes, you're, it, it literally you're, did. It's happened four you're, times you're, in the past. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You read me in your summary that there have been like multiple ethnic conflicts within India in the past few years. So like, why is the IMF solving for those? No, they're not the past few years. They were in like 1959. Oh, and none of those them. resulted in a genocide. Yeah, because they didn't have nuclear weapons, but they did result in massive oh, okay. conflicts. So yes, I would say they probably did result in genocide. Yeah. I don't know the they, literature they, on it. They weren't genocide. Okay. Okay, that's this is really okay. you guys really quick. The definition of genocide is the deliberate killing of a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying that nation or group. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Pakistan India is. and Pakistan is in ethnic conflict. I mean, and I'm sure you've read like other. press releases of the politicians and people okay, honestly, literally like saying they want honestly, to destroy the other nation. You can probably just prove that it's not happening. So this is like not All a right. good Yeah, you can do that. Question. Here's the question. Can I have a question? Yeah. All right, so you say that SAPs are the only reason they went to CPEC. So if SAP stopped in 2014 and CPEC happened in 2015, how is that true? Our no, evidence- so, first, of all, first of all, you've conceded the Oxium evidence from 2020 that says that um, SAPs are still happening. Second no, of all, it doesn't matter. Can you let me finish? Austerity yeah. is the same thing. No, oh, the SAPs oh, are certain type of Austerity measures force governments to like, cut social spending. It's the right, same thing. The the they don't. Thing. I've read Second your Oxfam evidence. It increases all, social spending. Second of all, it doesn't matter if the IMF did something bad in the past. The IMF is still bad for doing that in the past. And that's why they're in the circum a certain like condition. But I'll take the rest of my prep and before final. Okay. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> There's an echo. So it's going to go my case, their case. Oh, sorry. I just.
My opponents say that it takes one spark to initiate genocide. That spark was the IMF, and that is why you're voting neg today. Let's extend the framing. You're prioritizing genocide first because if you don't prioritize genocide, you allow it to compound in other regions of the world. They can see the framing, so I'm going to extend my argument. The Hussein evidence is conceded. It tells you that the IMF, by directly funneling money to the Rwandan government, allowed the Hutu minority to start a genocide against the Tutsis in the country. The IMF knew that um, genocide was the IMF. Sorry, I just got logged out of my doc for some reason. Would you mind? Paused. Just re in. So sorry about that. Just give me a second. Okay. Okay. The IMF knew that weapons were being stockpiled and yet did nothing leading to a genocide that would kill close to 100,000 people. The impacts are still happening today as the IMF supplied weapons and armed groups from the genocide are now killing millions in Congo. This A always on time frame because this genocide has been occurring for 30 years and that's conceded in every single speech and B, it links better into the framing and I'll tell you why. They have two responses and the first was that like it, it was uh, um, the ethnic divide happened before four and 2,000 people died. It doesn't matter insofar as the, insofar as the IMF ca uniquely caused this one specific genocide, even if it's bad, the IMF contributed to this one, which is why you should always reject it. But then secondly, that ethnic conflict was not a genocide. And it wasn't like considered a genocide. It was just an ethnic conflict between two groups. This was uniquely bad because the IMF directly supplied weapons to the Hutu government, which used them to oppress the Tutsis. Then they say that it was because of the Rwanda, sorry, the, the, the leader being killed. But A, I would say, sorry, but A, um, that was like the, the only way that the genocide would have been able to be started in the first place is if they had the weapons and they've conceded without the IMF, it would be really, really hard for them to get the weapons. All of their evidence that they had weapons before was A, new in second summary, B, like not to the extent at which genocide was possible and C, the IMF is still bad for contributing to it. On their case, they're not winning here either. You extend the Abdul turn. Previous previous IMF loans forced Pakistan to take on massive debt from other actors, increasing interest rates to 17% and crushing their economy. Hussein indicates that the IMF forces governments they dislike to pass unpopular policies, increasing their, sorry, um, basically, what you need to take from that is that uh, they, they, the, the IMF, in increasing interest rates on Pakistani debt, force them to turn to other actors like China in the first place. They say that SAPs are no longer happening anymore. It doesn't matter insofar as they did happen. And this topic is weighing the past benefits and harms of the IMF as well. Thus, since the IMF is the root cause of Pakistan's instability in the in past, it's obviously not happening. Also, our oxygen evidence from 2019 says that SAPs are still happening. Thus, negate. All right. It's going to be um, on um, on our C one, then on their case, and that should be all. Is anyone not ready? The argument from our C1 is pretty clear. It says from Chadbury that CPEC is really, really expansionary for Pakistan and India views it as an ethnic expansion of the state, which makes them afraid and acts and forces them to attack Pakistan first with conventional means. Finally, the Times of India writes that specifically under IMF loans in 2021, when they give the loan, they force the other country, namely Pakistan, to stop taking commercial loans from China. That's conceded. The argument goes that Sachs finds that because they delay the debt that is being paid to China and because they are not building up expansionary policies within Pakistan, India does not see this as a threat to their nation and therefore does not attack with conventional means. If they did, however, Wilson writes that they would respond with nuclear force, destroying the nation and destroying the country completely, leading to two billion lives lost holistically. They make the argument that from Abdul that like the IMF is the root cause of it, but they miss our response. They mishandle it. We are saying that SAPs stopped in 2014. The argument is because SAPs did not cause four, there's no reason how they have any link into the internal warrant. They just say that it caused CPEC to happen. But it is very clear in our case that because CPEC was specifically stopped by the IMF, the conflict did not escalate. It doesn't matter if it was happening before, it was stopped before it could escalate, which is our entire argument. They say on their case that our warrants onto their, like linking into their subpoint B are ridiculous. But remember our argument, it's that way before the Rwandan genocide, way before the IMF came in, there were already tensions and there were already the ability to do this. We like the argument is that 20,000 lives were lost in nine without the IMF. There's no unique reason as to why the IMF is the sole reason it 
Specifically, they say our spark argument is weak, but recall that our argument is that if economic downturn was the root cause, and if buying weapons was the root cause, then any recession could have caused this, which is why shooting down the president's plane was the spark that lit the conflict. For the Wang Mayhol does, we outweigh on scope, we both link into genocide, just recall that ours is at a much larger scale. Good round, Dale. Good round. Okay, I was the last one to submit. So um, if everyone wants to come back. 
Okay. Very cool. Okay. Well, first of all, um, I want to say that it's a huge congratulations to everybody who made it this point. Honestly, I mean, I say this every time, but it is an incredible achievement. The further you get, the more incredible it is. Um, and I think this is a great round overall, a great debate. I'm sure the other judges would agree with me. So you should all be very, very proud of yourselves. Um, with that said, it is a 3-0 decision for the NEG. Um, I can go first, I guess. Um, yeah. So I think that my decision just basically comes down to, I don't think the app has a link into genocide. This is like kind of hard for me because I'm really trying to be very like, I, I'm the whole, the whole round I'm trying to be very like tech over truth and everything, because that's like what I, that's like my philosophy, that's my paradigm, stuff like that. Um, but I'm also in a genocide class at my university right now, and I've researched genocide for two years. Um, so I just kind of have a lot of background knowledge on this. It makes it really hard for me to um, kind of accept that the arguments made by the app on face. Um, it, it's not, I mean, and I think that, that the app struggles too, even if I wasn't, if I didn't have that background, I think the app struggles because like y'all say, that there is um that like it, you know it's an ethnic conflict which makes it a genocide essentially right because they're targeting people because of their ethnic backgrounds but then you also go on to say that there were eth ethnic conflicts in rwanda beforehand that were not genocides those two things seem pretty contradictory right so clearly there's something unique about genocide that, some, a, that makes it a distinct crime from just a general war um so i don't buy that but i think i think the thing is that even if i do buy it like even if i do go totally tech over truth um i think the neg still wins i think that an important concession by the af on the genocide framing is this like third warrant that's extended throughout the whole round on the like reason for the genocide framing which is that like as judges we have a responsibility to reject the institutions that perpetuate genocide regardless of like the actual material implication that's going to have so i don't think it actually matters that the saps have stopped because I, you know, by my vote still has a responsibility to reject the IMF if I believe that it, it has committed genocide or has contributed to genocide, right? So even if the SAPs have stopped, I think that the AF never really properly deals with the Abdul evidence, um, which tells me that the original cause of the Indopax or like of the CPAC stuff is, was the IMF. And then if I do buy that that's a genocide or going to turn into a genocide or whatever, then I believe the IMF is the root cause of that. And so I still have a responsibility to reject the institution essentially. Um, and then I think on Rwanda, I think the the, uh, the neg pretty cleanly wins this. I don't think that like the neg really the neg pretty cleanly wins this. I don't think the app ever really interacts with the armament stuff, um, which I think that it you know there can be ethnic tensions beforehand. But I buy that the only reason the genocide was able to happen at the time that it was was because of um, the IMF funding the arms. So that is my decision. Okay, I can go next. So yeah, I basically agree. So on the framework. So I, I think uh, a lot of what was said in the framework while it was being read in rebuttal should have been extended. Um, like it could be implicated in a way that it, it doesn't matter if they prevent a genocide, but the fact they caused one means that they should be rejected. Like that should be an implication in like every speech because it kind of kind of goes conceited. But like at the end of the round, the way I thought the like the text of the framework is different, but like both teams kind of were interpreting the, the framework as in like whoever solves more genocide should win the round. So that's kind of what I went with. Like, I, I don't think the text is actually like that. And I think um, I, I think the AF team really, really needs to uh, do some more framework debating because just trying to link in is a little lazy. Like uh, there's, there's like plenty of good reasons why util is good. Like that's the classic response to any framework that isn't util. Um, so on, on, um, so Rwanda, I think giving arms like that, that when conceded, like that's a big problem for the app, like that when conceded and that, that's basically the link. So there, there's that. And then on Indopack. So I, before I even like start reading evidence, uh, I think conceding that the SAPs were the root cause of the problem just means that the IMF did cause the thing and like even if they fixed it it's still like a wash so like that's like kind of defense at that point so that that's over then but uh if I read further so I I just happened to take a look at one of the one of the cards um let me uh pull it up so the the Sachs card um, kind of says that Pakistan has a lot of problems with CPEC and like they're 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 not very happy about it either. So I there's that. 
like if I wanted to like look at evidence that would be something I complain about and then like I think the but one thing that Meg needs to do better is more impact defense on the impact scenario like policy debaters have been reading this stuff for like 20 years and there's a reason why nothing's happened so if, if you just have like one good card on impact defense then it would make your lives a lot easier but uh yeah that's my RFD. Yeah, so I, I agree with all the points uh, made by judges uh, Confist and uh, Lou. And uh, congratulations to both the teams. Both the teams did really well. And uh, hearty congratulations for getting into uh, the quarterfinals. It's, it's a great achievement for both the teams. And uh, primarily, actually, uh, in terms of my ballot, I pretty much agree with what uh, both the judges said so far. Uh, the primary reason actually I went in favor of the con team uh, was because the point that was made by them uh, in terms of IMF funds actually have uh, actually helping the supply of arms and that particular point could have been better contended by the pro team as well uh, so that pretty much actually struck out for me in addition to the few other points in terms of Uganda and a few other contentions that were made and uh, that's the reason actually my vote went in favor, favor of the next team uh, so congratulations again and good luck with the next round thank you so much yeah, good luck. Right, cool thank you so much right. good luck in the rest of the rounds congratulations and thank you everyone. thank you yeah yeah thanks so